Well, t today I'm tasked with, uh, as it were, telling you why some of the fantastic ideas that uh, I've not only heard about uh, today, um, but uh, probably over the 10-year history of the Academy, uh, in some cases haven't come to pass. Um, I suppose I, I'm, I'm building on a, one comment that I saw written uh, uh, on the slides this morning, uh, Professor Evans said that uh, in the region he was talking about most uh, delivery uh, built environment is delivered by the private sector. And it's, it's really that I'm going to be focusing on. But first, uh, please indulge me as I, I, I want to uh, actually talk about, well, well what is the future of, of urbanism from a, a global perspective? And um, I think... Uh, one very, very key global trend uh, has to be uh, pulled out here, which is uh, the growth of Generation Y. Um, generation Y, or the millennial generation, appears to be very different uh, from previous generations. And I would argue that uh, for this generation, urbanism has never, or for any generation previously, urbanism has never been more important. Um, if for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, I really want to emphasize that uh, Generation Y is a global phenomenon. Uh, these are selected hi uh, hipsters from all around the world. Um, there are females of the species, but they don't have the same comedy value. <laughs> now, um, the reason I put up this slide is simply to say Generation Y, uh, the, th the key thing about a lot of these people, you will see in their hands is, at, uh, is modern technology, a tablet or an um, a, a iPhone or whatever. And if they ha they're not holding it, it's in their handcrafted satchel. Um, <laughs> so the point is, these people are connected. We are now connected to everything everywhere. So place starts to become a choice. If you could do everything everywhere and a kid in a... A Korean kid in his bedroom can invent a multi-million pound game. Actually, you don't have to be where the capital is. You don't have to be where the raw materials is, uh, are. You don't even have to be where the markets are. What you do need to be is where the ideas are, where the human interactions are, and where you're going to bump into your next business idea or partner or whatever. So we find the habitats that Generation Y are looking for and wanting and where the strongest economic activity is, is in very particular sorts of places um, all around the world. This seems to be a very common theme. It's what's going on on the street, at street level, that really, really matters. And uh, we find that in this age where digitalization is a given, and of course, we uh, you know, are all talking about smart cities, thinking very much about the hardware, um, it's actually all about attracting human capital and the places that attract human capital. And one of the things we're starting to find is that it's not just the city that attracts the human capital, but a particular neighborhood. So neighborhoods have commercial value in the real economic world. Um, and th the sort of features that... Uh, come up again and again are a very wide variety of activities where work, working, playing, living and staying or visiting um, are all intermixed. There's, uh, there's so much uh, pull away from the single use. Um, so we're finding that all over the world, and I deliberately put up a slide I used in a talk I gave earlier this year in Sydney, um, you know, this is an, uh, uh, an Australian example, but you could take a US example or a European example. These are not the environments where the new economy and where Generation Y is at actually happening now. Out of town, cut off places are not the thing. And what strikes me over and over again as um, I look around the world is that urbanism, streets, if you like, getting people from where they are to where they want to be, have worked for us throughout history. This is uh, Narbonne, the, uh, the Roman road in Narbonne. And what fascinates me about this photo is that the paved surface uh, is a few meters uh, below the current street. But you can see the street's still there, filled with cafes and shops and what have you. 
And also, when we look acro across the globe, um, we find that when people are left to their own devices to build their own habitats, um, they seem to do it in a remarkably similar way. Uh, this is Darvi in Mumbai, and uh, I have become very interested in squatter communities, uh, so-called slums, informal settlements, and so forth, not because I'm a great fan of lack of sanitation and uh, the lack of facilities, but because it is extraordinary how similarly uh, people build their places, uh, build their neighbourhoods, so that uh, favelas in Sao Paulo is very similar to medieval Florence, for example. And also, the sort of street life that you look at here is very similar to uh, that hipster environment in uh, Williamsburg. You know, it, it, it is all part of the same sort of habitat. So, um, you know, I would, I would moot that this is actually what sustainable urbanism is. And we've done a lot of work over the years looking at the commercial value of sustainable urbanism. Uh, it's been called all sorts of different things. And I'm going to flick through the next slides very quickly because most of you have probably seen them already. I certainly hope you've come across uh, some of our work, which simply shows that um, where you build, uh, in this case, we called it sustainable, sustainable urbanism against a comparable um, uh, standard urbanism, which has, shows up very indistinctly here. The point is the value is higher. Um, and we keep finding the value is higher when you build proper streets and create good places over and over again. This is some very recent work we've done uh, on housing estates in London. Um, even, uh, you know, the, the main thing is that the value on a per hectare, your land value, uh, sort of intensity of use um, value is uh, greater. And even on a per square foot, this is residential uh, basis, it's higher. So we keep coming up with this evidence. And we've got to the stage where actually we've got pretty tired of just uh, uh, doing that sort of work and repeating uh, that evidence. And the question that we've been asking now for a few years is just, not does it work, uh, is it higher value, is it co a commercial thing to do, but actually why isn't it always done? And this is where I think things get really interesting because you have to start looking at the way we do things, uh, and Pam spoke earlier about the silos of the industry, how our business models are structured, how our finance is structured, how our land system is structured, has a huge amount to do with the answer to this very basic question. And it's that that I want to try and uh, uh, say something about today. So um, what exactly is it, do we think, that's working against urbanism? Well, I've talked about Generation Y, but here is the boomer generation, some very happy hippies, not hipsters, but hippies. And I think we have to look at this sort of demographic. Uh, the phenomenon of the late 20th century is a very peculiar and particular time in history. Um, I've put a, a famous sort of institutional uh, investor up here. There are, are others uh, available. Um, <laughs> because the two are very, very linked. And uh, we're starting to find this, where you get a big demographic, a big and growingly well, increasingly wealthy demographic uh, in a country, you tend to get much more uh, in the way of savings. So uh, in emerging Asia now, we're starting to see the rise of these institutions. But the purpose of, of institutions like this during the late 20th century was to grow capital for the growing middle classes. So there's a growing amount of productivity and wealth. And uh, in the late 20th century, people were by and large, saving, and the job of the institutions was to put as much money in as large sums as they could possibly manage into single assets that were going to grow in value. And real estate actually proved a pretty good way of doing that. Um, but the important thing, of course, about these uh, hippies, uh, the, uh, the young of the 1960s, is that they're now aging. And what these institutions are now looking at is not capital growth, but income production. There is a global hunt, primarily uh, from uh, institutions within Europe and uh, North America uh, and Australasia, for 
long-term income streams. And that's a very, very different financial backdrop to the one that drove investment and hence property real estate finance in the late 20th century. And I think it's going to prove incredibly important. So what we've had as a result of those uh, late 20th century sort of lumps of money, concentrations of capital, is uh, to take an extreme, shall we say, in, in the UK, the speculative house builder model. And the important thing about this, this is a very fancy diagram which simply says that it's build it and bugger off. You buy the original uh, land from the landowner, the landowner original landowner exits. You get it done as quickly as you can in the shortest possible time. And then there are new occupiers and hence new landowners. Um, it's a short-term model and it's, it's one that doesn't involve ongoing ownership. It provides those returns to investors um, very uh, quickly and it grows <coughs> land value out of the planning system. Why is this important? Well, again, this is a graph that I have shown before, but um, I want to spend a little bit of time on it. What it shows is our studies of good examples of placemaking. And it's set against, so that, that blue block there represents our final sort of asset values of uh, places we've observed that have, a, a, if you like, a placemaking premium. It's yet another piece of evidence to show that placemaking does pay. Sustainable urbanism pays. But um, what, it, what, what it really shows is that if you're, you're building and getting out of um, the place very early on, you don't benefit from that increased value. It's actually whoever goes and buys the land from you as a developer. So the developer who has the, the control, the capability of producing a good place actually has no ongoing financial interest in that place, no, no mechanism for actually extracting those value uplifts. Now, the reason I put this long run um, growth uh, capital growth chart with forecasts on is that we are increasingly seeing a situation in common with most other global cities um, in London and elsewhere where big gateway prime cities that have seen a huge amount of capital pointed at them since uh, the end of the Second World War have quite possibly reached what you might call a high plateau. It's very, very questionable if growth is going to be as accelerated as that in future. And I, I've just raised the question, if that underlying red line is lower, um, suddenly your placemaking capability, your capability to add value to land really matters. And it really matters, that value uplift really matters to the invest, new investors who are in there for the long-term income stream rather than the quick get in, get out or the, cap, the capital growth story. So how your place performs, not just in terms of the end asset value it produces, which we know sustainable urbanism will provide, but how it actually per performs in terms of the costs of running, ongoingly maintaining and sustaining that place, how it produces rental growth, because if you've got um, a low yield environment where capital values are very full, your growth is going to be determined by how much rents grow. And rents not just from housing, but from all sorts of uh, other commercial uh, uses and human activities, which in good places are very many and varied. And by the way, a, a, a reason we should not be talking about producing housing units, but producing actually good places for people to exist in. And just to sort of emphasize that at the moment, um, certainly as far as the UK is concerned, we are reliant, and I'm by no means knocking speculative house builders because they are the only uh, show in town pretty much in terms of producing uh, the housing that we need. Um, but just to show that they're very much at the mercy of really what the market's doing, I think uh, it's, wor it's worth showing this slide, which simply shows house UK housing output in relation to overall transaction volumes. And what I'm trying to get across here is that most developers, and th I, this is definitely true of the UK, I suspect it's true of other uh, Western countries as well, are market takers, not market makers. In other words, um, 
it's all the placemaking that's been done by other people over the centuries in the past that actually they are tapping into. And I think this chart illustrates it at a very high level because it shows that they can basically uh, take no more than about, or supply no more than about 10% of whatever market is happening at any one time. So um, on, the, on one side, you've got transaction levels in blue, and on the other side, you've got 10% of that uh, in red. So annual house building starts will be very rarely more than 10% of uh, the housing market, the whole housing market. So we're, 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 when we talk about development, and especially when we talk about housing supply, we're talking about a very, very small amount of the, the total built environment. The market's actually being made in real existing places. And what um, a new model has to be able to do is actually tap into that. Now, uh, so where do, where do the solutions lie? Where should we be looking? Well, I think we concentrate a huge amount on uh, product and thinking about what things look like, how they feel, how they perform, how they behave. And we don't actually look very much at the mechanisms by which uh, that performance happens. And money and land are probably uh, massively under-researched relative to the sort of design, uh, intensity of design, or indeed the, the whole sort of way that we do the money in the land is not designed as in a sophisticated as a way as we actually build the buildings and product. Um, so I, I'll, I'll come back to that, but very quickly if I can, there's a build it and go away sort of a land model. There's a, a trading, a serial ownership, and an emphasis on plot when you get the standard sort of development. If you look at, uh, this is, uh, happens to be Bourneville, you've got this long-term stewardship which enables things to go on and develop and change over time. Um, uh, uh, re revenue is, uh, o tends to be over time, in the, and we've got Grosvenor Estate here, uh, building Mayfair and uh, owning it is a pretty good business model, it seems. Uh, so you've got this continuity, ongoing interest uh, in place, a real contrast to sort of how things are done normally. That's the land side. Then you've got um, actually how things are built and, 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 the, and the fundamental differences, which I think we're all pretty familiar with, so I'm not going to dwell on this. But on the money side, there are big implications of that type of built form, uh, those sort of streets with mixed use um, and lots of activities ongoing, which actually mean you need lo uh, to to be looking uh, at, in fact, good urbanism is really well suited to generating long-term income streams from a variety of uh, sources um, and so forth. Um, you're talking about uh, building a place premium and, and somehow tapping into that. Um, generally speaking, I think you're looking at equity funding or more equity funding, which is certainly the way the world's going, seems to be going anyway, than debt funding, because debt has to re be repaid over um, if not the short term, then, then the medium term. So um, it's very difficult to build um, the, the really long-term value. So going back to that, uh, what, we, what we've found over the years is that really all these elements, land, money, and product, have to come together. Of course, uh, we, we have to be talking about high quality, diverse, durable, and flexible product, but an ongoing land interest seems to be a key factor. The willingness of a, a, an equity investor um, or a large scale investor to put money into a whole place for the long term would seem to be uh, a, a really good prerequisite to uh, producing sustainable urbanism. And, uh, this focus on income rather than on uh, capital growth, I think, will be incredibly um, important. Where they all come together requires actually a new business model, which I've characterized here as common ground. Now, they could be all sorts of things uh, from the um, sort of private sector landed estate model right through to uh, community co-ops and uh, land trusts and so forth. But I hope that what I've been able to do here is just illustrate how a whole series of global uh, and long-term demographic factors and finance is going to come together to either enable us to do this, uh, but certainly showing that the industry, the built environment industry, has to adapt in order for it to happen. Thank you very much.